It happens every year. In fact, it may have happened this very Sunday morning. Every year in January, I take two weeks and I talk about stewardship. I talk about money and it never fails. There is someone who's going to come here and you've been praying, oh, First Baptist member, you've been praying for this person and you've been talking to them and you've been inviting them to come to church and they've been resistant. They've been hesitant. And you say, why? Why won't you come? And they said something like this, because every time I go to church, all they talk about is money. But they finally, they finally decided to come. And today they're here. And, and you've told them, no, 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 it's different. No, it won't be like that. Come. And they're looking at you right now like this. See? And so I know that I run that risk. I know that there are those of you who are guests here, they're the very, very, very first time. I want you to know, I, I do talk about stewardship. I talk about money. We preach on this topic, usually two weeks in January. In fact, last Sunday, there was a couple that came and they take a vacation to Coleman uh, to see some family. It happens every year. They come the second weekend of January. They've come the last two years. And so they come to me and they came this year, now three times, three Januaries in a row. And this is the only time they ever come to our church. And they said, man, you... You talk about giving a lot. <laughs> now, I know that it's true that it may be that you're here, and, and, and it is true that you, you think, man, you know, some, some of these churches are all about money. I don't know a lot of churches that are all about money, but I do know people who are all about money. And that's why the Bible talks so much about money, and that's why we have to talk about it so it doesn't have a hold on us. And so I want you to turn today. Our text is Mark chapter 12. And today is going to be part two of two of our stewardship series this January. Mark chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 38. And right off the bat, I would just address one potential objection as you're turning to Mark chapter 12. And that is to anyone who would say, well, I don't know about giving to the church because there's a lot of crooks. There's a lot of preachers that are just out there to bilk, you know, your money and, and take your hard-earned money and fuel their private jets and... You know, I, I don't know about that. There's a lot of crooks out there. To which I would say, not only are you correct, Jesus actually agrees with you. Look at what Jesus says in Mark chapter 12, verse 38. Look at what he says. In his teaching, now remember, Jesus has been teaching in the temple. This is what we call the Passion Week, Holy Week, leading up to his uh, uh, death, burial, and resurrection. He's been teaching in the temple. He just got through teaching the, 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 the teachers of the law who asked him, what's the greatest commandment of the law? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. The second one's to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he talks to the Sadducees about the resurrection. And now we get to this, and, and he gives a warning. In his teaching, verse 38, he said, in his teaching, Jesus said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces. And they have the best seats at the SEC game. I'm sorry, synagogue, synagogue. I, I thought it was a, a new translation. They have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts. What's he saying here? Be careful what spiritual leader you follow because not everybody's in it for the right reasons. And it turns out that there are some who are all about, look at me, look at me. And if somebody is self-centered, if it's always look at me, then there's no room for look at God. And you can't live a God-centered life as a minister if you're living a self-centered life. And so these guys, they love to be seen. Oh, that long flowing robe. They love the places of honor. They love all the titles that come with it. Now, we modern preachers, we don't get public acclaim and approval from long robes, marketplace greetings, and the best seats at synagogues. No, no. We have social media. And in this way, we, I mean, it, I don't have, some people have social media. And in this way, we're able to, in a subtle way, look at me. And it's usually in a very humble way, right? It's usually, look at my family, how perfect. Look at, the, look at these kids on their own. They decide to have a little prayer time while they're knitting blankets for the poor, right? <laughs> Let me go ahead and put that on social media because that's what Jesus would do. Hey, I'm dying on the cross. Selfie, like, come on. But, right, nobody ever posts, nobody ever posts what real life's about. We post this, all oh, this beautiful thing, right? Nobody ever, here's a, here's a picture of me beating my kids in the minivan, right? <laughs> Keeping it real. <laughs> no, they don't do that. Not everybody's in it for the right way. 
But by way of contrast, may I just say a personal word? By way of contrast, I've been in Coleman now almost three years. I have been blown away by the ministers in this city. They are the most humble, God-honoring men that I've ever had the privilege to work with. And I mean that. I, I mean, this city, this county, uh, we love each other as ministers working together. A sense of camaraderie and kingdom building. Guys, that doesn't happen everywhere. That's a blessing. Not every county is so lucky. Not every city is so lucky. Have ministers who truly see one another as, as co-laborers in the gospel. And not every city is like that. In fact, these... This, this, this place in Jesus' day was filled with religious people. They weren't about God. They were using God for their own selfish gain. In fact, it gets worse. Some of the scribes were apparently convincing widows to give well beyond what they should have been giving. And in this way, look at how Jesus says it. They devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Does this mean they were going to widows' houses and offering to make a big, long blessing over the house if they would, if they would give a big offering? Uh, uh, some, of the, some of the scribes were also uh, sort of temple lawyers, if you will. Sort of a, a weird job description, but they sort of oversaw the, uh, some of the, the, the widows' affairs and were cheating them. They were bilking them. I cannot read this verse. They had no, in that something, they had no problem draining these widows. These widows had nothing to live on. They had no problem draining their bank accounts to fatten their own. I cannot read this verse without thinking uh, how I've seen this in real life. I can't read this verse without thinking of sweet Miss Esther. My church in New York, we baptized her when she was 83 years old. She was a lifelong Jew who became a Jew for Jesus. Messianic Jew and uh, I remember going there. She, she didn't have much. I'd go to her apartment. And I, I would notice she had a, quite a stack of mail. I mean, I'm going, it, she, she owed, I think, her, her landlord, her HOA fee, and like her phone bill. That was the only bill she should have been paying. And dutifully, she showed me her check register. She was paying all these bills. Turns out, I, came, I, I looked at them. She was getting a letter from one of these televangelists. And he would send her a letter and he was asking for money, asking for donation. Now, nah, that's not the end of the earth. But she was a widow. She couldn't see very well. She was elderly. And, and so uh, what this televangelist would do on his letter, he made it look like a bill. So it would say something like, urgent, second notice, still have not received from you this donation in this amount. And, it, and you, know, you could tear it off and send it back in just like it was a bill. Oh, now, at the fine print, at the very bottom of the at the very bottom of the thing, in the teeny tiny fi fine print, it would say, this is not actually a bill. This is a tax-deductible charitable donation. But Esther never saw that. And here she was. She didn't want to be late on any of her bills. And so she would dutifully write out a check every month and send it in. And what do you do with it? What do you do with a minister like that? I mentioned it to a guy in my church who knew a guy who knew a guy. <laughs> and a problem took care of itself. No, no, no. I saw what I did. That's not what I did. That's not my job. Why? Look at what Jesus says. Unless that man repents, they'll receive the greater condemnation. Let me explain something to you. I'm not that man's judge or jury, but there is a judge. And he sees. And he sees. And he says, one of my friends, I was talking about this up in New York. We were helping Miss Esther. We were trying, doing our best. Our little church trying to, trying to help this. And he saw that stack. And he didn't, he, he didn't have any filter. And he looked at me. He goes, there's a special place in hell. Well, that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of what 40B says. Greater condemnation. So, man, I don't listen. I don't want any part in this. I mean, usually when preachers preach on giving and stewardship, you know, the people squirm. That's not what this is about. This is about ministers squirming. This is meant to be convicting to us. We ministers need to hear a word about stewardship and generosity. And I want to know: Am I generous? I don't. I don't want to be like that. I, I, no. I would never want to come under that kind of judgment. So how do I know if I'm being generous? And that's just it. That's just it. For all of us on a message about generosity, that's the question. How do I know if I'm being generous? Because we are very bad as humans at being self-aware enough to judge really any of our character traits, but especially generosity. Because if you ask somebody, are you generous, 100% of the time, the answer is yes. And you are. Because your mind immediately goes to the times and examples when you've been generous. Now, that 
may have nothing at all to do with whether you're a generous person, but you can think of examples of generosity, therefore you falsely assume you're being generous. Yeah, I helped that little old lady across the street and didn't even charge her. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, somebody was having a fun drive and I put a little extra in the, you know, I dropped it in the Salvation Army kettle. Yeah, I'm a generous person. That doesn't mean you're generous. That means you thought of times when you did generous things, when you gave. I, this happens all, imagine hypothetically, <laughs> hypothetically, this wouldn't happen in your home, but imagine if your wife looks at you and says, honey, you just don't help out around the house. No one who hears that thinks, huh, considering everything, and looking at it from a big picture perspective, that is generally an accurate statement. <laughs> Nobody says that. What do you do? Your mind does what everybody does. You race to the immediate counterexample. Don't say I never help out around the house. Don't say I don't help around, out around the house. I unloaded the dishwasher. Do you remember? I unloaded the dishwasher without being asked. No one, I unloaded the dishwasher. I remember the year was 2008. I remember it like it was yesterday. And on that day in 2008, with no one asking me, I unloaded the dishwasher. How are you going to tell me I don't help out around the house? <laughs> what happened? You're not helping out around the house. You thought of an example when you did. When it comes to generosity, can we all just agree? You're all average generous. We're all average generous. We all, yes, we're all generous. In fact, the aggregate tax data in this country teaches us. And the average income, remember, 45000 50000 in this country, somewhere around there. Did you know the average American, according to tax data, gives away 6% of their income? So that's average generous. You've all done it. You've given. We, I've given. Okay. Yes. But we're Christians. We've been. But the God of the universe has given his only begotten son and touched our heart and so filled it with God's love that we're not supposed to be average in generosity. We're supposed to be truly generous. So are we supposed to compare ourselves to average U.S. American tax data? Is that how we're supposed to know if we're generous? I mean, that's usually how we compare ourselves. Just think of generous examples or compare ourselves to somebody else. No. What we want to know is this. Not are you generous, but how does God measure generosity? That's what we want to know this morning. That's the question that this whole sermon's about. How does God measure generosity? If you're a note taker, how does God measure generosity? And here's how. It's a simple story. He tells us in Mark 12. He gives us an example of how we can know how God measures generosity. Because, I mean, when you step back, I just want to, I, I can't say this enough. We all, we all just kind of assume we're generous. Nobody's sitting here going, oh, man, this sermon's for me. I'm stingy, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm Scrooge. No, we all. What we need is to dig down deep a little bit. Uh, this occurred to me uh, recently. I, I was in a hotel, and uh, they had, in, in the bathroom, they had a big mirror, which is not uncommon. All bathrooms have a big mirror. And I was shaving and looking at myself in the mirror. And I was like, yeah, I did a good job shaving. I didn't, I didn't miss any spots, did a good job. Then I noticed off to the side, have you ever seen one of these? It was a smaller mirror, a round mirror with like a convex or concave. It had a curve. Uh, and it had like a spotlight all around it. And you could like swivel the arm around and get close. And if I thought about it, I, I realized, I think my wife has one of these. You can use it when you put on makeup or whatever. But it's like a close-up mirror. Well, I'd never used one of those before, but I, you know, I was kind of goofing around and looking, and I thought I did a good, good job shaving. I, I wonder what it looks like in that mirror. I mean, I know, I know, looking in this big, broad mirror from a distance, I'm like, yeah, I look good. And then this little mirror's like, really? You think you look good? You think you look good? Yeah? Let me put my spotlight of judgment on you. And I bring that thing close and suddenly like, you thought you looked good. Your face is cratered and pockmarked like the moon. I'm like, what happened? This little mirror. I, I'm telling you, I did a good job shaving. And then suddenly, I did a terrible job shaving. What happened? I put the spotlight of the small mirror up close. That's what Mark 12 does. You're not going to be able to walk out of here. and I mean, generally speaking, you're going to be able to walk out and go, oh, yeah, I'm a generous person. Mark 12 says, hold up. Let's put that spotlight of God's word real close. Let's look. Let's get real practical and real personal about this. How does God measure generosity? Well, the story is not hard to understand. It starts in verse 41, this, this thing that happens next. And he sat down. Okay, so apparently Jesus was, had had enough. He needed a break from debating with the Sadducees. He had just told them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. That's what started the discussion. He'd had enough from that. He takes a break. 
And he sits down opposite the treasury and watch the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. What is this? What is this treasury? Well, Jesus must have been sitting down in the temple, what they call the court of women. Now, this doesn't mean that women only were in this particular courtyard. No, remember, the temple was based on increasing degrees of exclusivity. Outside the temple, outside, everybody could go. Therefore, they called the outside courtyard the temple of Gentiles. Uh, uh, excuse me, the, the, the court of Gentiles. Jewish men could go there, Jewish women could go there, and Gentiles could go freely. Anyone who wasn't allowed within the temple. In fact, there was a sign warning Gentiles that you cannot come any further. If you do, you're fine to come in. But if you do, the reason you died was because of your choice. Okay? So it's very clear about that. Then you would come in and you would walk into this gate. You'd walk in through the gate beautiful. And Jewish men and women were allowed in the second courtyard. And that's where the treasury was. That's where these offering boxes. We'll talk about that in just a second. That's where they were. So they call it the court of women. But the reason they call it the court of women is because men and women were allowed there. And you guessed it. Then only Jewish men were allowed to go into the next courtyard. As we're getting closer and closer to the Holy of Holies. The next courtyard was called the court of Israel. And then you know the story. Only priests were allowed to go to offer the twice a day sacrifices in the holy place. The holy place. You may remember from a sermon in December, Zechariah got nominated. Remember, he got picked to get to go in to offer that. It was a great honor. So he got to go into the holy place. Only one priest would go in in the morning, one priest in the evening, and they would offer that sacrifice there and then leave. And there's still one more place of exclusivity. And that's not the holy place. That's the holy place of holies and you may remember in the holy of holies only one time a year only the high priest got to go in there on the day of atonement so there's these building levels of exclusivity well jesus is here preaching and teaching he's talking in the court of women you know jewish men and women and he sits down and we know he's in the court of women because that's where these offering boxes were this 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 treasury it was actually 13 collection devices and they were brass and shaped to receive coins. They were shaped, imagine a big brass jar with a big flare at the top. And so they were called the 13 trumpets. The shofar, the shofarot. It's just the Hebrew plural for trumpets. And the 13 trumpets made of brass were there. Each one had a label and you would give. But this was the temple treasury. This is how you funded the work of the temple, the maintenance of the temple, the upkeep of the temple, the, uh, 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 the priestly system, the sacrifices. This is how you would do it. You would come in and you would put the money in these uh, 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 trumpets. And notice, many rich people, it says, put in large sums. And what a noise this must have made. Think about it. They didn't have paper currency. Nobody was writing a check. Nobody was giving online. They had tablets, but not like ours. Nobody could do that. And so what did you have? You had coins. You had Roman coins. Some were very valuable, some were not. But you had hard currency coins. So imagine you're one of these rich people. You're dragging up bags of coins. Imagine the sound as you're clanging it off a brass trumpet. You know, clang, crash, bing, and it's all going. You're dumping in these massive, what a... Ear, what a deafening sound it must have been to see these large amounts going in. And every time you could hear it, right? And the temple's being funded and, you know, presumably the idea, the, the glory of God as these gifts are going in, right? Well, the problem, of course, is that sometimes it became more about the show of the gift than the gift. They were no longer about the state. They were about the sizzle. And they started dumping in these big coins. In fact, some commentators think this is what Jesus had in mind in Matthew chapter 6, verse 2 of the Sermon on the Mount when he said, don't give your alms like the hypocrites do. How do they give? They like to sound a big trumpet before they're giving. Some commentators think he's referring to these offering boxes. They like to go in and go in big with all this sound and all, hey, look at me, right? Look at how much I'm giving. What's the application here? Jesus is saying, when you give, give simply. Don't make a big deal about it. Don't crash and, and try to make a big sound. Get, give simply, man. Get, dump your offering and move on. Do it stealthily. Do it so fast your left hand doesn't even know what your right hand is doing. Okay? Do it in such a way that you give simply. What's the modern day version of this? 
when you do your giving, still to this day, give simply. Don't give a big gift and make a big fanfare. Don't, don't give and say, well, I'm going to give, but I expect a plaque in here. I, I want a statue in the point, you know. I'll give, but I want it to say, today's bulletin brought to you by. <laughs> you know? that, that was a joke. Don't, yeah. <laughs> Not an idea. <laughs> give simply. Well, back to the story. Jesus watched many people put money into the offering plate. Can we just talk? Can we just talk about that for a second? I mean, how awkward. There's Jesus. Can you imagine if we passed the offering plate and we had Pastor Scott follow the plate and watch every one of you give? Mm-hmm. 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 Right? If we did that, you would say, oh, man, that, that's no big deal. Pastor Scott's a man just like me. Oh, okay, fine. What if Jesus were there? watching you as the plate went by. Plate goes by. You're looking at Jesus. Jesus is looking at you. I gave online. <laughs> or something. Right? Awkward. Can you imagine if Jesus could see everything you gave? Now I'm sure at this point, the disciples, Jesus just watching, he's hearing all these big amounts go into the trumpets. And I imagine these disciples are getting fascinated, right? There's Thomas, there's Matthew, the old tax collector, in his mind, he's got a spreadsheet. Mm, if you compound the interest, right? There's Judas going, oh, right? They're all watching all this go in. Jesus is watching the whole thing, and they expect Jesus to give praise to these people. They're funding the temple. Isn't Jesus pro temple? Well, verse 42, you know this story, it's famous. And then, ah, then the old widow's might. An old widow hobbles up amidst all these large gifts. And then a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. That's a great translation because it gets us immediately to the worth of these coins. Uh, any of you want to go to Walmart and see what you can get for half a penny? It ain't much. In fact, it's nothing. You put them together, you got a whole penny. Congratulations. Now go on a shopping spree. What can you get? Nothing. Nothing. In Greek, these were two leptons. The small, this is the smallest coin you had. She had two of them. Mark translates it as the quadrons because remember, Mark's writing for a Roman audience. So he puts it in Latin for his Roman audience. But the point is, these are the two smallest copper coins. Now, how much of a big sound could she have made? In the, she have made, in the midst of all these coins going in, she couldn't have made a big noise if she tried. Even if she tried to thump those coins in there as hard as she could, they're barely going to make a little tiny noise. Utterly unnoticed. Small, quiet, she gives, she gives simply, and notice she gives well. Look at what she gives. Every, unnoticed by everyone, but not unnoticed by Jesus. Look at what he says. And he called his disciples to him and said to them. Now, I have no idea if the widow heard this or not. We don't know. We just don't know. I imagine that she did. I imagine, in fact, Jesus says, hold everything, hold up. In fact, I imagine the poor widow's trying to sneak in because she knows it's such a small amount. She drops it in, tries to leave, and Jesus says, stop everything. She's like, busted. <laughs> and he gives this speech. But we don't know. She may have been gone by the time. But either way, Jesus, who's watching everything, calls his boys together. He says, hey, 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 I got to show you something. I got to point this out. Something just touched my heart. Something just impressed Jesus. Hello? Jesus, and he says, truly I say to you, I want you to see something, guys. Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. Can you imagine? All these massive amounts coming in, and Jesus says, this woman gave more than all of them combined. And the disciples are seeing this massive amount, and they see this two, together less than a penny. They're looking at Jesus, looking at these big amounts, looking back at Jesus. She gave more. So finally, don't you imagine one of them, maybe the tax collector, maybe Matthew, he's like, uh, Jesus? You're obviously not a math person. <laughs> that is most certainly more than that. That can fund all sorts of ministries for the temple. That can't fund much of anything. But then he shares with them the fundamental 
principle of generosity. He gives them the point of this whole sermon and the answer to the sermon's question, how does God measure generosity? He lets them understand the truth about how to know whether or not you are generous. And he gives them this principle. Four, they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. And there it is. The two coins are all she had to live on that day. The idea that there were two coins is important, which means she, even if she had given one, it would have been a tremendous gift. She gave all, which meant she wouldn't be able to eat that day. Someone else would be able to eat, but she wouldn't. She would fast the remainder of that day and start again tomorrow. She gave all she had to live on. I will go without because I'm going to sacrifice for the Lord. W what is the principle that Jesus is praising here? Well, how does God measure generosity? It's very simple. God's heart has never been impressed by amounts, and neither should yours. God's heart is stirred by percentage. There's lots of ways to say this, but it all says the same thing. It's not the portion, it's the proportion. It's not the sum, it's the sacrifice. It's not the amount, it's the percent. It's not the amount we give. Oh, look how much I gave. Pat myself on the back. It's not the amount we give. It's the amount we keep for ourselves. I would word it like this. God measures generosity in percents, not amounts. That's how God measures generosity. That's how to know if you're generous. God measures generosity in percents, not amounts. Imagine this with me. Say you are the person who counts the offering at, at First Baptist Church. We have a group of volunteers that do that. It may, you, you, you may or may not know uh, the pastors. We, we don't do we, I have no idea who gives what. I have no idea. Any giving records. Uh, but we have a group of volunteers. I mean, somebody has to do that. I mean, at some point, somebody's got to know. We have a financial secretary. At some point, you've got to, you know, to get a tax on it and all that stuff. We've got to keep records of this stuff. So imagine, though, that you're on that volunteer squad and you're counting the offering. And you see the checks. You see who gives what. Here's the question. How do you know on a Monday morning, if you're counting the church's offering, how do you know who was generous? The answer is, you can't. You have no idea. All you see is amounts. All God sees is percentages. And you have no idea. A person that you may think is not being generous may be very generous. A person you think is being very generous is not being generous at all. Is, uh, is a $10,000 gift to the church a generous gift? I have no idea. It's a big amount. I have no idea. Is a $1,000 gift a generous gift? I have no idea. Is a $20 gift a generous gift? I have no idea. Because some people could give $1,000 and never miss it. Other people could give $20 and it would mean they're going to have to scrimp and sacrifice that week. Which means that person was more generous than the one who gave a thousand. Just God's math. Is half a slice of pizza a big gift? Depends. Is it New York pizza or like <laughs> Chicago? I, uh, if, I'm, uh, if I'm charged by, if, uh, if BJ says, hey, I, I need a hand. We're ordering pizza for the youth ministry tonight. I need 12 pizzas. And he gives me the church credit card and I go up here to the pizza this place and I, I get 12 pizzas and I come back with 12 pizzas. Is half a slice of pizza a big gift? If on the way back I encounter someone who's homeless and, and they're destitute and they need help and they ask for help and out of 12 pizzas I, I pull apart half of one slice and give it to them you would be ashamed of me and you're right. You'd be embarrassed by that. Out of 12 pizzas you're going to give away one little, that the church paid for? You, was, you Come on. So it's not a big gift. On the other hand, I want, and I saw this with my own two eyes. I saw a fella, he was a homeless guy, and somebody was trying to bless him. He was sitting out of side of a pizzeria in New York. You know, you buy those big slices, and somebody bought him a slice. You could tell he was hungry, and he was about to eat it. And then he saw his buddy, and he called his friend over, who also looked pretty homeless. And I watched him tear that slice in half and give his friend half. That's a big gift to somebody who's only going to eat one slice a day. You understand? We have no idea. We measure generosity by amounts. And here's what that means. Here's how to apply that. Here's what that means. That means some of you, this is going to be one of the most freeing messages on giving you've ever heard. Some of you, starting today, you can stop beating yourself up because of the amount you're giving. 
you're sacrificing and you're given a percentage that is incredible and you're sacrificing and you're doing exactly what obedient child, blood-bought children of God should do, but you're beating yourself up because the amount is so low. There's no need to beat yourself up. It's not about the amount. It's about the percentage. Others of you, on the other hand, this is going to be a challenge because it's easy to begin deceiving yourself. When you were young, you gave a small amount and the amounts have gotten bigger and God's blessed you and the amounts have gotten bigger and bigger and the amounts have gotten bigger, but the percentage really hadn't. And today's going to be a challenging message. You are not the best judge of your own giving because we tend to look at amounts. God looks at percent. We talked last week about tithing. Tithing is nowhere in the New Testament are we legislated. Nowhere in the New Testament are we commanded to tithe. Tithe is a type of percentage giving that happens to be 10%. It's not there. We're not under law. We're under grace. So the New Testament percentage is not about 10%. Many Christians view 10% as a starting point because that's what was required in the Old Testament. But some of you are going to have some homework. You're going to go home. You're going to think about what percentage do we live on? Of our income that God blessed us with, do we live on 100% of it? Do we live on 90% and save 10? Do we live on 80% save 10 and give 10? Do we live on 110% where credit card leveraged out to the max? You live on some percent of your income. What are you keeping for yourself? How much do you need to keep for yourself? That's how God measures generosity. It's not about the sum, it's about the sacrifice. In fact, this story took place in the temple on some land that itself was a kind of sacrifice. It goes all the way back to 2 Samuel 24 or 1 Chronicles 21. It goes all the way back to a man named David. David, you remember, wasn't allowed to build the temple, but he got to, he got to pick the land. And he goes and he finds just the land that God has laid out for this temple that's one day going to, years from now, going to be the holy land. It's going to be the temple mount. And he buys that land. Do you remember the, the guy who owned the land was a guy named Ornan? Do you remember this story? It was a threshing floor for Mr. Ornan. And David said, this is a perfect place. The threshing floor is very valuable property, so I would like to pay you top dollar for it. Ornan says, whoa, 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 you're the king. This is for God. Take it. David says, no, 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 no. I don't want you to give it to me. I want to pay top dollar for it. He says, no, 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 no. I insist you got to take it. And David says, and I insist I got to pay for it. Here's why. I will not offer God something that costs me nothing. He understood it wasn't about the sum. It wasn't about the amount. That didn't matter. It was about the sacrifice. It was about the heart. And of course, the musicians are going to come and lead us in a time of response. I... When Jesus said this, of course, we remember the context, don't we? Jesus had just said what? When when Jesus looked at this widow, do you realize, when Jesus is sitting here by the treasury, do you realize Jesus has 48 hours to live? 48 hours to live. And he's just preached his heart out. And what was his sermon? Do you remember his sermon? His sermon was love the Lord your God with what percentage of your heart? Do you remember? Love the Lord your God with what? Come again? All. All. What was his point? God doesn't do fractions. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And he's looking around going, does anybody get this? Does anybody get what I'm trying to do? The disciples bless their hearts thought they were going to go be rich. The disciples thought they were about to hit it big. Jesus is going to be king. And he's looking around going, what do I have to love the Lord your God with all your heart. This is about sacrifice. He's about to give everything at Gethsemane. He's about to realize, I'm going to drink this cup. He knows. And he's going, does anybody get this? And, and it's not lost on him. Jesus was on the Father's timetable. He knew what was going on in Judas. He knew how Satan was going to enter his heart. It was not lost on him that as people came to be to give those big gifts. Some of them gave silver coins into the temple treasury. Jesus knew when he saw those silver coins, one of them would equal another and another, and together 30 of them would be the very same silver coins that would be used to bribe Judas to betray him. The very coins going into that treasury were going to be his blood money. He knew it. And he's looking around going, does anybody get this? You're all impressed by money and you're all impressed by amounts. Does anybody see? It's about a love relationship with God. All your heart. He doesn't do fractions. He doesn't want part of your heart. All your heart. All your soul. All your mind. Stewardship. Everything you have is God's. Does anybody see it? What a gift to Jesus. When that widow hobbles up 
And who knows how the Holy Spirit put on her heart that day that Jesus would need that encouragement. Right in that moment, he'd be so blessed to see it. And she drops in all that she had. And Jesus can say, that's my sermon. That's what I'm trying to say. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This widow gets it. She gets it. I have no idea what those two copper coins will look like in the new heaven and new earth. But I guarantee we'll see them again. Because that's how God's economy works. You're going to forget about all these big gifts and you're going to forget about this big grant and all this big, oh, it's all the fanfare. Oh, no, 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 no. But those two copper coins in the new heaven, new earth, can you imagine what they're going to look like in their glorified state? Can you imagine what you've given sacrificially is going to look like in the new heaven, new earth? Do you know what God can do to bless? Oh, you can't outgive him. And stewardship, really, I mean, this ends the series, but really stewardship is not a two-part January series on money, is it? Stewardship's a lifestyle all year long where we realize everything we have is God's. And with everything I have, I want to love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, because that's how he gave to me. Let's pray. God, thank you. You are a giver. Thank you, oh God, for the example of this widow's might that we can learn what to do. Thank you for the example of the braggadocious scribes that we can learn what not to do. And thank you, oh God, for a generous people. Thank you, oh God, that you are still calling us to love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. And our money is just one of the many ways we reflect that love for you. Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you, God, that you don't do fractions. Thank you that you didn't just save part of me. Thank you, God, that you saved 100% of these sinners of whom I am chief. God, you've redeemed us and you're shaping us and making us more and more to think and to feel and to act like you when it comes to generosity. And God, I ask that you grow us in faith. Grow us in our sacrificial giving. It's not about the amount. It's never been about the sum. It's about the sacrifice, God. Grant that to us. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.